This is a weird contrast to question number 41, because in 41, we were really asking about the disagreement between the two passages. And now 42 is basically saying that there's a commonality or an agreement between them. And, and that seems to run counter to what we just did in 41. But this is a common thing that the SAT does. The passages will disagree, but they'll ask what they agree on. There's usually something very weak that they do agree on. The other problem, though, with number 42 is I don't remember reading anything about abolitionism in either passage. We've done a lot of questions here, so what gives? Why did we miss this? That's a disconcerting thing, especially with the no reading strategy that I use, because the point of that strategy is that you're supposed to cover everything that's important. But luckily, abolitionism is a specific enough word that I can kind of skim for that word, and then that probably is where the answer is going to be. And just looking up, I can see that Thoreau talks about abolitionists right at the end. So he says, I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property from the government, and not wait till they constitute a majority of one before they suffer the right to prevail through them. I think that it is enough if they have God on their side without waiting for that other one. Moreover, any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. I barely understood that. That's okay. I, I, I get that it's about abolitionists. He's saying something about people acting. I, I don't really know. I'm just going to be like, okay, I know it's there. I'll look back at it if I need to. Let's look at Lincoln, though, see what he says. So we read all this, but it actually, if we skim, he talks about abolitionism right here. There is no grievance that is a fit object of redress by mob law in any case that arises, as for instance the promulgation of abolitionism, one of two positions is necessarily true, that, it, that is, the, re, the thing is right within itself and therefore deserves the protection of all law and all good citizens, or it is wrong and therefore proper to be prohibited by legal enactments, and in neither case is the interposition of mob law either necessary, justifiable, or excusable. Ugh. You can tell, just me reading it, I'm tripping over the words. This is not good language, right? It's not something we're familiar with. But I understood one thing here. I see that he's not really saying whether it's right or wrong. He's doing this kind of like, if it is right or if it is wrong. He's kind of like not passing judgment. So that's kind of weird. No judgment. Um, ugh, I hate that word. Judgment does not have an E. So we don't have a lot to go on, but hopefully the answer choices can tell us a little bit more about what we just read, because I don't really understand it right now. Okay, both authors see the cause as warranting drastic action. Well, drastic is about as strong of a word as we get, and I think I would have read that, them saying... We need, to, we need to get rid of slavery. They were not saying that. Certainly not Lincoln. He was doing what I just said, this passing no judgment, like if it is right, if it is wrong kind of stuff. So that's too strong for what I read. I would have known if they were saying that abolitionism requires drastic action. Choice B, both authors view the cause as central to their argument. Well, I just know that from my own experience, right? We just had to skim for this word. It's mentioned briefly at the end of each passage. If it was central to their argument, we would have read about it before. So the fact that we just had to like search for abolitionism tells us it's not central to their argument. C, neither author expects the cause to win widespread acceptance. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Let's look at D. Neither author embraces the cause as his own. Well, that kind of matches with Lincoln where he's saying, it's. I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. I'm just saying abolitionism, you know, shouldn't, go through mob rule. Uh, I don't remember that with Thoreau. But comparing that now to choice C, it looks a little better. That's probably the better guess because I know it works for Lincoln. Um, neither author expects the cause to win widespread acceptance. Well, they didn't really predict anything. They didn't say that we predict that abolitionism won't be popular. So that's not great. I know what kind of words I'd be looking for to prove C, and I didn't, I didn't see any of them. Let's look at Thoreau again and see if we can make D work for Thoreau. 
He says, I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists. Okay, he's not embracing it. He's saying other people call themselves abolitionists. Other people, not me. I'm not an abolitionist. So it's, it's a stretch, but sometimes we need to do this stretching, and we really only understand what we're reading and what we're looking for once we've looked at the choices, gotten rid of some terrible ones, and kind of narrowed it down to a couple that could make sense. So D is the answer here. And it's definitely hard, but one thing I really, really want to talk about is uh, the fact that you're supposed to answer these questions based only on the passage. This is not a history test. It is not asking you to memorize facts about American history. All of the facts that you would need are going to be provided in the passage. And I say this because Lincoln in particular is very tricky. If I were to ask you, what is Abraham Lincoln famous for? Most people would say he freed the slaves, right? The Emancipation Proclamation. It's about getting rid of slavery. That is Lincoln's thing. However, Lincoln is very, very tricky in American history. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He ran for president in 1860 saying, I don't want to abolish slavery. I just want to prevent it from spreading into new states and territories. It's a very nuanced position, but it goes really against what we expect of Lincoln. We think of Lincoln. He's the great emancipator. He freed the slaves. He's got that memorial in Washington, D.C. because of it. And yet, that was a very small part of his life. He, for most of his life, was not an abolitionist. And this is the problem, is that you think of him as the guy who abolished slavery. But most of the writings that we get from Lincoln... It happened before his presidency, but even during his presidency, they are not abolitionist. They are saying that slavery is fine where it exists now and that we shouldn't break the laws, which it says here, he shouldn't break the law to oppose slavery. That's very, very tough. But this is why, you know, no matter what uh, history class you're taking in school, you cannot use that information to answer the questions on the SAT. You have to stick to the passage. Beware of Lincoln in particular. He comes up again and again. He's in a lot of SATs. Lincoln is very tricky. So just try to file that one away. That definitely has helped some of my students do better on these old-timey passages. So hopefully it helps you too.